Today's lecture is on the French and Indian War. And this is the first colossal movement that American were really involved in. And what you begin to see developing is prior to this, there had already been three world wars that encompass the British on one side, the French on another. And this is the fourth of those world wars. Now, the one prior to this had been the War of Austrian Succession. And after that was over, there was what was called the Diplomatic Revolution, where the Austrians got their eternal enemies, the French and the Russians, plus the Spanish and the German states on one side against Prussia on the other. Britain will side with Prussia mostly because of the fact that the French were on the opposing side and they begin to battle over basically Western Pennsylvania and the Ohio Valley. Okay. Now this is where George Washington comes into play for the very first time. In a quick little reading from Joseph Ellis's book on Washington. History first noticed George Washington in 1753 as a daring and resourceful 21-year-old messenger sent on a dangerous mission into the American wilderness. He carried a letter from Governor of Virginia Robert Dinwiddie addressed to the commander of French troops in the vast region west of the Blue Ridge Mountains and south of the Great Lakes that the Virginians called Ohio Country. He was ordered to lead a small party over the Blue Ridge, then across the Allegheny Mountains, and there to rendezvous with an influential Indian chief called Half King. He was then to proceed to a French outpost at Prescott Island, present-day Erie, Pennsylvania, where he would deliver his message in the name of His Britannic Majesty. Basically, what he was to say was, get out of our land, you French people. And the French, when he gets there, listen to what he has to say, give him very nice accommodations, and then say, no, this is our land. It's not your land. La Salle had traveled down this 60 years before. Now, what makes this interesting for Washington, this is where the world first becomes aware of George Washington. At this moment, he, when he returns, he is told by the governor of Virginia to write down all of his accounts. And they appear in several colonial newspapers and then reprinted in magazines in Britain and Scotland. And though he was only an emissary at age 21, he gains a name for himself at this point that you will see develop later on as well. Now, he is eventually sent back to Western Pennsylvania. Uh, in this case, to grab a fort. The British had started to construct a fort at the mouth of the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers, which formed the Ohio, present-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The French had captured that fort while it was being built, renamed it Fort Duquesne. Washington leads a force of about 300 Virginians and Native Americans west to capture Fort Duquesne. They're about 30 miles for, short of the fort and at that place they run into a French patrol. They attack the French patrol and in one of the more interesting things out of Washington's own history, George Washington uh, is really to blame in certain ways for a massacre that takes place of the French uh, officer and French soldiers who had been wounded and captured. In interrogating the French officer, Washington did not understand French that well, but the Indian chief who was with him understood French very well, and then sunk his hatchet into the head of the French officer spilling his brains out and then washed his hands and his bra brains and his blood. The rest of the Native Americans then attacked the wounded French, 11 of them, and scalped them. Now, 
the surviving French had made their way back to Fort Duquesne. George Washington is forced to construct a hasty little fort known as Fort Necessity about 30 miles from Fort Duquesne. The French come back, surround the fort, eventually capture Washington and his men on July 4th, ironically, and Washington is forced to surrender and agree for one year not to come back. This in many ways is the first shots of the French and Indian War. The French are not going to give up Ohio country. The British cannot allow them to stay there. So the British will send General Braddock and about 600 first line British soldiers to capture Fort Duquesne. Now he will push west. He will use George Washington as his aide because he knew the area well. But Braddock does not always listen to Washington's advice, especially about how to fight. Because he says, look, this is not the way you fight a war. You don't stand out in the open and you don't wear your red coats. So Braddock goes and is about 10 to 12 miles from Fort Duquesne. He is spotted. The French and the Indians attack him. And Braddock is killed along with a lot of Braddock's men. George Washington has two horses shot out from underneath him. He has four musket ball holes in his coat, but he himself is not touched. He rallies the remaining troops in a, in a retreat, and they retreat back to the Virginia frontier. This touches off officially the war in North America, known as the French and Indian War, but to the rest of the world it was the Seven Years War. And this is the fourth of those world wars. It's fought in North America, it's fought in the Caribbean, it's fought in South America, it's fought in Europe, it's fought in uh, India, it's a world war, and in the Mediterranean. Now, in the European side of this, it is basically all of Europe against Frederick of Prussia, who will earn the title Frederick the Great because he manages for seven years to withstand the assaults of the Austrians, the French, and the Russians, basically by running back and forth across the tiny country of Prussia and defeating each one in turn and managing to keep his army alive. As you can see in North America, there's a wide variety of battles that takes place from this map. The most important ones being in Canada. This becomes sort of the realization of William Pitt. Pitt is the one who engineers war and is seen as the savior of Britain in the French and Indian War. When he takes control in 1758, he realizes this the way to win the war is to capture Canada and he uses British resources and the American colonial resources to that end. We capture Fort Duquesne in 1758. It's followed quickly by Quebec and Montreal. The battle for Quebec being the most important and it's the battle between General Wolfe and General Montcalm on the Plains of Abraham. The British Navy also is key to this because they control the seas, which will ultimately lead to the Peace of Paris in 1763, ending the war. In this, France lost all of her Canadian possessions and most of her empire in India and claims to lands in the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi River. The French and the English, you can see what they got, and there's a map on the preceding page that shows that, at least what takes place in North America even though New Orleans is ceded to the Spanish, not to the British, as the way it looks on that map. Now, what comes out of this is, for the British, we're very upset with the Americans not obeying the rules. American merchants traded with the French. It was very hard for the British to get the American colonials to fight. They basically had to bribe them. And American colonials felt like they were treated by, like second-class citizens by the British officers who looked down upon American contributions. Benjamin Franklin actually tried to organize the colonies with the Albany Plan and had published this famous uh, cartoon which appears a lot on the AP exam. 
and it's join or die, but it was for the French and Indian War that the colonies needed to join together to fight. The British blocked this, and many of the colonies blocked it as well. Thank you.